Brothers and sisters, the council has the following announcements. The offering this morning is for Rehoboth, and this afternoon the offering is for the work of the deacons. The council requests the congregation to submit names of men deemed suitable for the office of elder and deacon as elders Bert de Geer, Peter de Jong, John Kippers, and Shane Peters, and as deacon, Brother Trevor Peters, having completed their respective terms of office. Letters of nomination, along with supporting biblical reasons, should be submitted to council by April 8th, the Lord willing. The congregation is reminded of the service held tonight at Hillcrest, the Lord willing, at 7 o'clock. Thus far the announcements, let us now rise and lift up our hearts to the Lord and worship. As we come into God's holy presence, we confess that our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's lift up our voices and worship our holy God. Psalm 30, stanzas 1 and 2. The Bible says that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. As we come into worship this morning before a holy God, we acknowledge our sinfulness, but we also look to the perfect righteousness that we have in Christ and in that righteousness as a washed congregation, we worship our God and Savior. God gives us his law as a guide to a life of renewal and new life and the power of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus. Here are the words of God's law from Deuteronomy chapter five. God says all these words to you. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments." You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy, 
as the Lord your God commanded you, six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your ox or your donkey or any of your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God commanded you, that your days may be long and that it may go well with you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder And you shall not commit adultery. And you shall not steal. And you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. And you shall not desire your neighbor's house, his field or his male servant or his female servant, his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. The law of God, we sing Psalm 30, stanzas 3 and 4, as we confess that we can only walk in the righteousness which we have in Christ through the power of God's Spirit leading us and guiding us. Psalm 30, stanzas 3 and 4. Let's humble ourselves in prayer before the Lord and ask for a blessing on the opening, the reading, and the preaching of his holy word. Father, you've called us into your presence this morning, and by the grace of your Holy Spirit working in us, you've brought us to this place at this time, gathered as your holy congregation, men, women, and children washed in the blood of the Lamb. And Lord, how good it is to know that gospel that you have plucked us from the pit of sin and death. That you have raised us up in Christ Jesus our Lord as a holy congregation of righteous people with zero righteousness in ourselves, but with infinite righteousness in our Lord Jesus. That we are gathered here, O Lord, dressed in the white robes of his perfect righteousness. That our sin is gone and we know it no more. It has been nailed to the cross. And so, Father, what a way to begin the week. To lift up your name as we lift up our voices. To sing 
to the Lord, to bless your name and to tell of your salvation from day to day. That's how we begin this Lord's Day. That's how we begin this week and that's how we want to live our lives, O Lord, declaring your glory among the nations and your marvelous works among all the peoples for you are great and you are greatly to be praised. Splendor and majesty are before you. Strength and beauty are in your sanctuary. And we, together with all the families of the congregation of God's people all around the world, the church Catholic all over the earth, and the church in glory, we, O Lord, we ascribe to you glory and strength. We ascribe to you the glory due to your name. We bring an offering of praise, an offering of our resources. We bring ourselves as living sacrifices of worship as we come into your courts and we worship you in the splendor of holiness. Oh, Lord God, we worship you as the great creator of all things. We worship you as the great redeemer of the universe and the redeemer of your people. And we worship you for giving us the privilege, the indescribable privilege of being called sons and daughters of the living God. That we, O oh Lord, are part of your family, that we are loved with an infinite and eternal and unbreakable covenant love in Jesus Christ. That we are accepted, that we belong, body and soul and life and death to our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. And Lord, every Sunday is a day of joy and every service of worship is a time for exalting in you and praising you, the great judge of all the earth. And today we thank you that we have even more reason to praise, Lord, as you've brought to us a new pastor and teacher who will be ordained this morning, our brother Fausto Amadjo. And oh Lord God, in all that happens in this service of worship, We pray that your holy name would be lifted up and glorified, that the Lord Jesus Christ would have all the preeminence, and that the power of the gospel may be driven deeply into our minds and our hearts and our lives, so that we are changed, O Lord, and transformed from glory to glory to love Christ more, to know Christ more, and to reflect the image of Christ more and more to the praise and the glory of your holy name. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's turn to the scriptures again, this time to Isaiah chapter 61. We're just going to start reading a few verses before the beginning of the chapter. We'll start in chapter 60, verse 19. And you will notice as we begin reading that, as he often does, Isaiah is getting so lifted up in the spirit as he preaches the gospel to the exiles that he begins to start talking in cosmic terms of cosmic restoration. And you will recognize in these first words a description of the new heavens and the new earth. So Isaiah chapter 60 verse 19, this is the word of God. The sun shall be no more your light by day, nor for brightness shall the moon give you light, but the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. Your sun shall no more go down, nor your moon withdraw itself, for the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your days of mourning shall be ended. Your people shall all be righteous, They shall possess the land forever, the branch of my planting, the work of my hands that I might be glorified. The least one shall become a clan and the smallest one a mighty nation. I am the Lord. In its time, I will hasten it. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captors and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, 
to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. Strangers shall stand and tend your flocks. Foreigners shall be your plowmen and vine dressers, but you shall be called the priests of the Lord. They shall speak of you as the ministers of our God. You shall eat the wealth of the nations, and in their glory you shall boast. Instead of your shame, there shall be a double portion. Instead of dishonor, they shall rejoice in their lot. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess a double portion. They shall have everlasting joy, for I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrong. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their offspring shall be known among the nations and their descendants in the midst of the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge them that they are an offspring the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its sprouts and as a garden causes what is sown in it to sprout up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before all the nations. So let's sing in preparation for the sermon, Psalm 30, stanza 5. The sermon for this morning is based on the text, or is, is a sermon on the text, Isaiah 61, verses 1 through to 3. We've read those verses together. If you have your Bible open, you will be able to follow the sermon more easily, because I'll go through the text as it's before us here, Isaiah 61, 1, 2, and 3. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, this morning we're going to witness something which is fairly rare in the Reformed and Christian liturgy in the church of us. We're going to see and witness the laying on of hands as our brother Faustin is ordained to the office of minister of the word and the sacraments. What does it mean, this laying on of hands? It is a public consecration and commissioning to office. When Moses inducted Joshua into his place to be the leader of God's people, it was done through the laying on of hands. You're commissioned, you're consecrated to office. The laying on of hands in the scriptures also has to do with the giving of the Holy Spirit, uh, the special gifts of the Holy Spirit. We read about that, for instance, in chapter 8, that it was when the apostles laid hands on the new believers that they received those special gifts which the Lord granted in the early church before the, the scriptures were fully completed. And then Paul speaks in his letters to Timothy about Timothy's ordination, that when Timothy received the laying on of hands of Paul and the presbytery or the presbyters, the elders, 
the consistory. When he received his laying on of hands, he received in that ordination the spirit and the gifts of the spirit to carry out his office. And so when we see the laying on of hands, God is reminding us that no one is sufficient unto these things. No one can be a deacon or an elder or a preacher in his own power. There's no hope. We can only do the work of the office to which God calls us when he empowers us by his spirit. And that's the promise of God, that when he calls to the special offices or to to any office that he calls us, when he calls, he equips. And he anoints us with his spirit to empower us to fulfill the office to which we are called. Now, our text, if you look at chapter 61, Our text speaks of such anointing. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. Anointed me for what? To bring good news. To bring the gospel. Isaiah has been ordained to preach the spirit-empowered gospel hope to afflicted exiles God will surely visit you. He will heal you. He will save you. He will comfort you. He will set you free to go home to the promised land. He will restore you and the land. And Isaiah is preaching these words of spirit-empowered gospel hope to exiles who aren't even exiles yet. He's speaking about the return before the exile has even happened. The words that Isaiah uses here in in much of his prophecy, the words that he uses to describe the future return from future exile, the words that he uses are so glorious. They're so cosmic that it cannot refer only to the return of from exile. You saw how we begin our reading. It's talking about the things that have to do with the new heavens and the new earth when there is no more sun, but the light of the universe is all in God. Without that mediated sun, that created sun, it's gone. So he's preaching about high and glorious and cosmic truths. And as you go through the book of Isaiah, in several places he speaks of a special servant of the Lord who was anointed by the Spirit of God, who will be a light to the nations, who will suffer in a most cruel way for the sins of God's people. And these are clear references in this prophecy to the Messiah, to our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, if we look at our text here, chapter 61, 1, 2, and 3, is this one of those references to that servant of the Lord, to the Messiah? Well, the Lord Jesus himself tells us it is. If you turn to Luke chapter 4, and you see there in Luke chapter 4 that the Lord Jesus goes into the synagogue on the Sabbath day in Nazareth, and he opens up the scroll because they didn't have Books like we did, they have rolls and they would open it up to the right spot. And he found Isaiah 61. The the, the chapters and the verses are later editions. It was just one document, but he found the space, the, the place, and he read the beginning of our text. See there in Luke chapter four, verse 18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. And he keeps reading right through the beginning of verse two in our text. Some of the words are slightly different. It has to do with the version he was reading, but the point is he's reading our text. And he's saying, when he finishes the reading, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, I am he. I am the Lord's anointed. And you know that anointed means the Christ, the Messiah. So Jesus came anointed by the Lord in his baptism when the Holy Spirit came upon him and he was, that was his ordination and he began from that moment on to exercise his earthly ministry as the Messiah and he preached the gospel. He preached the gospel of the kingdom. He preached the gospel of freedom from oppression, not the freedom of oppression of exile in Babylon, but he preached the return from the exile of sin 
into the presence of God. He was sent by God the Father to bring good news to the poor, not the poor that didn't have money per se, but the poor as the Bible describes true poverty. And as we read it about, read about it, for instance, in the Psalms, those who are afflicted, those who are lowly, those who are humble, crushed by enemies and by circumstances, crushed by the pain of this fallen sinful creation, crushed by the sins of others against them and oppressing them and hurting them, crushed even by their own sins. These are the poor in spirit and they are blessed for theirs is the kingdom of heaven and to them the gospel is preached. And he came He was sent to bind up the brokenhearted, those heavily weighed down with grief and mourning and brokenness. He said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He offered them renewal and restoration and relief. And he was sent to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Christ proclaimed to the people of God, to the, to, to, to the people of God, he proclaimed that you don't have to keep on being a slave to sin. That Christ set you free from the power of sin. You don't have to be an addict to sin. You don't have to be locked into sin and temptation and serve sin as a slave because if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And he was sent to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That's the first sentence in verse two. And this is where he ends his reading there in Luke chapter four. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And that's a reference to the year of Jubilee. Once every 50 years, there was an extra special sabbatical year. It was a year of joy. It was supposed to happen every 50 years. It didn't always happen in the history of God's people because they didn't listen to God, but that's the way it was supposed to be. Every 50 years, there was the forgiveness of debts, and there was freedom from slavery and indentured servitude, and the family inheritances that had to be sold off because people couldn't afford to keep them. They needed the money. Those family inheritances were returned to their original owners. It was a year of jubilation and rejoicing and setting things right, a year of relief and renewal and restoration, a year which pictured the power, the transforming power and grace of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now this was the message of Christ on earth. The kingdom has come. Sin and the devil no longer rule. Christ is king. Jesus suffers And he dies and he rises from the dead to proclaim that new reality that light has shone in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. He proclaimed the gospel from the cross as he said, it is finished. The power of sin has been broken. The debt of sin has been paid. And all of God's children are free to head back home to the Father knowing that they are loved and accepted and received by God in Christ, the meek may inherit the earth. And just before the Lord Jesus ascended into heaven to sit on the throne of the universe at God's right hand, he commissioned the apostles to carry on with the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom. And the apostles passed on the torch of preaching the gospel to the evangelists like Timothy, who passed it on to other men, who were able to teach other men. And so we have in the last 2,000 years, generation after generation of preachers. Until today, we come to Faustin Amadju, ordained today to be minister of the gospel of the church of Nirlandia. And today, he sends you, brother, and he gives you a mission. And he anoints you to bring good news, the good news of the kingdom, not your own thoughts and opinions, not what you think they need to hear, but what he commands you to speak. And not in your own power, but in, not in the power of human rhetoric and human oratory and human ability, 
but in the power of the Spirit of God. Now why? Why does God today anoint your new pastor with the Holy Spirit in his ordination? What does God send your new pastor to do? To bring good news, to preach gospel, comfort, comfort ye my people, speak of peace, so says our God, comfort those who sit in darkness mourning under sorrow's load, cry out to Jerusalem of the peace that waits for them, tell her that her sins I cover and her warfare now is over. That is the good news of Isaiah 40, which we're going to be singing after this sermon. And it is good because it recognizes and deals with the bad news. Look at our text here. You see all the bad news words? Just scan through this text. Look at all the bad news that that the text mentions. The poor and the brokenhearted and the captives and prison and bound, vengeance, mourning, faint spirit. There's lots of bad news in our text. But here's the good news, that God deals with the bad news, that God's children are set free from condemnation of sin, from the guilt of sin, from the power of sin, that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's the good news. Now, as I mentioned already, the Lord Jesus stops his reading in the synagogue right here at the beginning of verse 2. And there's a reason for that. His focus of his earthly ministry is the first step, making the beachhead for the kingdom of God, planting the flag of the kingdom in this world, breaking the powers of the kingdom of darkness, triumphing over them in the cross, canceling the record of debt that stood against us, nailing it to the cross, and rising from the grave on the third day to proclaim victory in which believers share. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory in our Lord Jesus Christ. So he focuses in his reading on that first stage accomplished by the work on the cross of bringing forgiveness and righteousness to his people. But what about those who do not want to accept it? What about those who don't want to receive that righteousness? What about those who do not in faith participate with him in his death and resurrection? Those who do not love Christ but love sin? Well, The Holy Spirit continues in our text speaking about the day of vengeance of our God because there remains for those who love sin, there remains only a fearful expectation of judgment and that warning is part of true gospel preaching. As the Catechism tells us, to proclaim to all sinners and hypocrites that the wrath of God remains on them and that they will not inherit the kingdom of God unless they repent. He comes again to judge the living and the dead. We confess it every Sunday. And so the warning of the gospel comes to us this morning again. Today is the day of salvation. Today when you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. If you're just going through the motions and you're making it look good enough to fool yourself and fool the people around you and fool the the office bearers, that's not good enough. Because that That screen, that mask is only going to last so long. God sees right through it. The herald's voice is crying in the desert far and near, calling all men to repentance since the kingdom now is here. Oh, that warning voice obey. Now prepare for God away. Let the valleys rise to meet him and the hills bow down to greet him. In other words, you've got to get right with God. You've got to get things set right in your heart and in your life because judgment is coming. That's part of the gospel message, to proclaim the year of God's favor and the day of the vengeance of our God. Now look at those two lines there and, and see the difference. It's the year of favor. It's the day of vengeance. That says something. Remember we sang Psalm 30? What did we sing? For his anger 
is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. The favor, the grace, is the main thing. The vengeance is important. It's real. It's a warning. It incites us to flee from sin and to hold on to Christ. But it's just a supporting role. Judgment is rushing towards us. And that is terror to the unbeliever and to those who are living in sin. But it is great comfort to the people of God. Because in all the church's sorrow and persecution, believers can lift up their head and eagerly await the return of the king who will cast sin and all those who love sin, all those who don't want to let go of sin, into everlasting condemnation. They'll be wiped from the face of the earth. That is good news, because who wants to live in the new heavens and the new earth for eternity where there are people that hurt other people, where there are people that betray other people, where there are people that abuse other people? That's not heaven. That's hell. And so it is great hope for the believer that the day of vengeance of our God is coming. It is good news. It is great comfort to those who mourn who have grief because of sin and pain, injustice, and wickedness in this world. The day of vengeance is the day of judgment. And on that day and through that judgment, God will establish the the fullness of his kingdom here on the new earth, with heaven having come down to earth, having smashed every human kingdom. The kingdom of Christ will have grown to become a mountain which fills the whole earth and every trace of the kingdom of darkness will be destroyed forever. And what a comfort this is to all true believers who mourn because of sin and its consequences. What a comfort this is to everyone who hates sin. We hate it with a holy hatred. We hate what it does to our hearts, to our minds, to our lives, to our homes, to our families, to our relationships, to our community, and to our world. And we long for that day when sin is no more. And that gospel God calls his preachers to proclaim. He sets his spirit upon them to preach the good news of the kingdom and to preach the power of God. You see that in verse 3? The kingdom of God is in the preaching and also the power of God. Look at at how verse 3 describes the results of gospel preaching. The power of the gospel is infinite. It is the power of God. It is like a hammer which smashes the rock into pieces. It is that word which goes forth and accomplishes what God has purposed for it. It does not return empty. It is the power to turn mourning into dancing. It is the power to take saints and wipe the ashes of mourning and grief off their heads and give them a covering of beauty. That, that beautiful headdress there in verse 3 is, is we can translate it as a, a turban of glory, a covering of glory. You see, preachers are not anointed and sent to preach a message which crushes God's people, which weighs them down so that they leave church thinking, man, I am such a bad person and my sin is so bad, and the world is so bad, and everything's bad, and I'm going to go home and feel miserable for the whole week until next Sunday I can get another dose of this. That's not gospel preaching. That's not good news. On the contrary, the gospel of the kingdom is the gospel of the transforming power of the Spirit of God who changes hard hearts of unbelief into hearts of flesh which love Christ through the miracle of regeneration, who changes the way we think through the renewing of our minds so that we have the mind of Christ, who changes our attitudes towards every aspect of life, including pain and brokenness, suffering and persecution, so that Christians, in the face of the greatest afflictions, they can stand up with a joy in their hearts, and count it all joy as they go through these things. What does the Bible say? 
If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Glory is on your head, believer, not the ashes of mourning, but the glory of the Spirit of God. And so what is proclaimed and determined for the believer is the oil of gladness and not of mourning. The Christian life is, cel- is marked by celebration. It is marked by the fruit of the Spirit, love and joy. That's why the apostle, he's sitting there in jail, he's manacled, he's chained, and he's suffered in countless ways. And what does he write to the church? Rejoice. And again I say, rejoice. He can't stop talking about joy, no matter how how much life hurts. Because there is everything to rejoice about, brothers and sisters, that Christ has conquered. And in him we are more than conquerors. And nothing can separate us from the love of God towards us in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing. So we were dressed in a garment of praise that is given to us instead of a faint spirit. It is not for God's people. It is not for the sons and daughters of the living God to have a spirit of fear and slavery. To sit there thinking, am I good enough? Maybe I'm not good enough. I I can't do this. I, I can't make it. And I'm tempted to just give up and to give in because I can never overcome the power of sin and temptation and all the evil in the world. I'm just gonna throw up my hands. That is not the spirit that God gives to his children. That is not where spirit empowered gospel preaching leaves believers. But on the contrary, It gives them a garment of praise. I am clothed in the perfect righteousness of Christ. The church is the bride of Christ, sanctified by the power of the Spirit through the washing of water by the Word in holy and perfect splendor, without spot, without wrinkle. That is who we are right now. And it just gets better from here on into eternity. And when we are blessed with the true preaching of that true gospel, then what what happens? Well, look at the next phrase here, that they may be called oaks of righteousness. You know, when you preach the gospel of Christ and the power of the Spirit, you must expect results. The word does not return empty. And the Spirit-anointed gospel preaching allows believers to drink in the Word deeply and to be rooted deeply in the Scriptures, to be raised and to be grown up, to be mighty, stately oaks, strong and immovable in the Lord, standing firm on the promises of the gospel. Not little grass trees, waving in the wind, tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine and every shift in the culture. Oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. This is not the work of man. It's the work of no preacher. It is the work of the Spirit of God as we are built on a solid foundation. That's what you can expect when you preach the gospel, to see God's church, God's children rejoicing in the freedom for which Christ has set them free. See them being changed and transformed by the power of the Spirit of Christ to stand tall in a world, in the world of of, of unrighteousness, to stand tall as unmistakable and solid testimonies of the righteousness of God. And why? Why is all of this happening? What's the goal of all of this? Look at the last phrase in our text. That he may be glorified. You know, when I was a teenager, I visited a church one time with a friend, and the the pastor was quite the orator. He was a good man and a good, faithful preacher. And after church, I visited a family, and the father in that family said, you know, what a preacher. What a man. May no one ever say that about you, Brother Falston. The mark of faithful gospel ministry is that you are reduced to nothing. 
As John the Baptist said, he must increase and I must decrease. What we hope as gospel preachers is that God's people would come out of church saying, what a gospel, what a savior, that he might be glorified. That's why you were created. That's why we all were created, to his glory. That's why he made the universe, to his glory. That is the goal of the kingdom, his glory. That's why the office bearers are called to shepherd the flock, to glory, to that day when the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That is the goal of everything. And that is the goal of preaching, to proclaim salvation in Christ so that the church responds, glory, glory be to God the Father, glory be to God the Son, glory be to God the Spirit, glory be to Him alone. Amen. Let's respond by lifting our voices in praise and giving glory to God as we sing the words of Isaiah chapter 40 in hymn 15, 1, 2, and 3.
We now proceed to the ordination and we'll be using the form that is on page 618 in the book of praise. Brothers and sisters, the consistory has now twice published the name of our brother Fausto Nemajo to learn if anyone had objections against his ordination to the ministry of the word. Since no one has brought forward anything lawful against his doctrine and life, we will now in the name of the Lord proceed to his ordination. Let us first hear what Holy Scripture teaches about the office of ministers of the word. The exalted Christ gathers his church through his word and spirit, and in his grace uses the ministry of man. The apostle Paul indicates this when he says, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ. As the chief shepherd who unceasingly cares for his flock, he appoints shepherds to take heed to the flock in his name. They are to take care of the sheep of Christ by means of the proclamation of the word, by the administration of the sacraments, and by prayers and pastoral supervision. In this way, the flock is tended and led in the right paths. In the early Christian church, this task was fulfilled by the apostles. They, in turn, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, appointed elders in every church. According to 1 Timothy 5.17, there were elders who ruled the congregation. Some of them were also called to labor in preaching and teaching. The latter are now called ministers of the word. They have received the ministry of reconciliation of which Paul speaks, saying, All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. The task of the minister of the word can be described as follows. First, he must declare the whole counsel of God to his congregation, proclaiming the word according to the command of the apostle Paul, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, And by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. After the example of the apostle, he is to perform this duty in public and from house to house. He shall expose all errors and heresies as unfruitful works of darkness and exhort the membership to walk as children of the light. He shall teach the word of God to the youth of the church and to others whom God calls, for the Holy Scriptures are able to instruct them for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. It is also his duty to visit the members of the congregation and to comfort the sick and sorrowing, thus comforting and admonishing he shall call the whole congregation to the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Second, he is called to administer the sacraments because Christ has joined this administration to the preaching of the gospel. It is therefore the duty of the minister of the word to administer holy baptism according to the command of Christ. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. He also is to administer the Holy Supper as instituted by Christ when he said, do this in remembrance of me. Third, it is his duty as pastor and teacher of the congregation to call upon the name of the Lord in public worship with supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings. Fourth, it is the duty of the minister of the word with the elders as stewards of the house of God to see to it that in the congregation all things are done in peace and good order. Together they shall supervise the doctrine and life of the membership as the apostle Peter said, shepherd the flock of God, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. In so doing, they are to shut and open the kingdom of God by Christian discipline, according to the charge given them by Christ. From all this, we see what glorious work the ministers of the word may perform. When the chief shepherd is manifested, they as faithful servants will obtain the unfading crown of glory. At this moment, I'd like to ask Brother Falston to come and and stand here at the front. And if there are any uh, ministers in good standing in the Canadian Reformed Churches or sister churches who are here present, I'd like to ask you to come forward and sit on the front row here at this time.
beloved brother Faustin Amadjo, you are now about to enter upon your office. We ask you to answer the following questions before God and his holy church. First, do you feel in your heart that God himself, through his congregation, has called you to this holy ministry? Second, do you believe the Old and the New Testament to be the only word of God and the complete doctrine of salvation? Do you reject all doctrines conflicting with it? Third, do you promise faithfully to discharge the duties of your office and to ordain the doctrine of God with a godly life? Do you also promise to submit to the discipline of the church in case you should become delinquent in doctrine or life? Brother Faustin, what is your answer? I do. If you would kneel, please, and if I can call forward the pastor and the elders who will participate in the laying on of hands. Brother Falston, God, our Heavenly Father, who has called you to this holy office, enlighten you with his spirit, and so govern you in your ministry that you may fulfill it obediently, and that it may bear fruit to the honor of his name and the expansion of the kingdom of his Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now let's sing Psalm 134, stanza 3, as we sing a blessing on our brother. Beloved brother in Christ, God our Father has obtained the church for himself with the blood of his own Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit has made you pastor and teacher of this congregation. Love Christ, feed his lambs, and tend his sheep, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly. Keep watch over yourself. Set the, the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Preach the pure doctrine so that by your preaching and teaching, the congregation may be kept in obedience to the word of God. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Do not neglect the gift you have with which the Lord has endowed you for this ministry. Devote yourself to your duties with all your strength and with perseverance, for by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. And there's a charge to the congregation, and brothers and sisters, I'd like you to stand up to receive this charge from the Lord. Beloved brothers and sisters, the Lord has granted you this servant. Receive him with all joy. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. Take heed to receive the word of God which you shall hear from him and accept his words spoken according to the Holy Scriptures, not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God. 
obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. If you thus receive this servant from the Lord, the peace of God will come upon you, and you will inherit eternal life through Christ. Now you may be seated, brothers and sisters, and also Brother Felsen, you may be seated. And since we of ourselves are not capable of all of this, we will call upon Almighty God. Merciful Father, it pleases you to gather to yourself out of the whole human race a church chosen to life eternal. We thank you that you gather this church by the ministry of men and that you give this minister of the word to this congregation. We pray that by your spirit you will equip him for the ministry to which you have called him. Enlighten his mind that he may understand the scriptures and open his mouth that he may proclaim the mysteries of the gospel with boldness. Grant him wisdom and faithfulness to guide the flock in the right path and to keep them in Christian peace. That by his ministry and under his good leadership, your church may be preserved and increased. Encourage and comfort him by your spirit so that he may remain steadfast in troubles and temptations during his ministry. And finally, with all your faithful servants, may enter the joy of his Lord. Grant that those entrusted to his pastoral care may acknowledge this servant as sent by you. Give that they may receive the instruction and admonition of Christ, which this shepherd shall bring to them, and that they may joyfully submit to his direction. Grant that through his ministry, all may believe in Christ and thus inherit eternal life. Hear us, O Father, through Jesus Christ, your Son, who with you and the Holy Spirit, one only God, lives and reigns forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we have the opportunity to give our thank offerings to the Lord for Rehoboth, and then after we have given our offerings to the Lord, we will Sing our final song standing. We shall him sing hymn number seven, one, two, three, and four.
Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. A few uh, greetings and felicitations from the different churches. Some are here, and maybe I'd like to start with uh, Reverend Wiesku who just sat down, <laughs> to bring the greetings from St. Albert, and I believe there is one from Hope also, if I'm not mistaken. And if there's anybody else, maybe sit up here, and then we can just go through them. And I got a few I'm going to read. microphone here yeah thank you brother I hardly got a word in edgeway so far so it's nice to have a chance to speak again <laughs> uh, the elders thought that since I was here anyway it would be fitting for me to bring greetings on behalf of the church in St. Albert we rejoice with you this morning and we you can tell we rejoice with you because a, a bunch of the congregation that's supposed to be in St. Albert are here that's how happy we are that the Lord has brought Faustin here to serve as your, your pastor we have enjoyed his work amongst us as he spent some months working in St. Albert and, and preaching the gospel. And yeah, Faustin and Magdalena became beloved by the congregation. Uh, there's a great love for them. There was a great appreciation for how he brought the gospel with joy and enthusiasm. And we have wonderful memories of that time. And so we're very, very happy for the church here in Irlandia that you get to have this blessing not just for a few months, but the Lord willing for many years. We praise the Lord together with you, and we ask that he would grant that the new pastor that you've received may be a great blessing to you as you grow in the Lord Jesus Christ, and that you as congregation would be a great blessing to him and to Magdalena. Thank you. Good morning. My name is uh, Henry Vanderveen, and I'm an elder in the Providence Canadian Reformed Church. For those that don't know me, I'm also the father of Leanne Van Lahr. I'd like to share with you uh, a few words from the Providence Canadian Reformed Consistory and Church. Dear Reverend Faustin Imadju and the Nerlandia Canadian Reformed Church community, Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. With hearts full of joy and gratitude, we extend our warmest congratulations to you on the ordination of Reverend Faustin and Maju and the Nerlandia Canadian Reformed Church steadfast commitment to spreading the gospel. Your dedication and faithfulness to the Lord's work are truly inspiring reflecting the spirit of Isaiah 52, verse 7. This is the ESV. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, and who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Reverend Imadju, as you step into the role of shepherd for the Nerlandia community, may your feet continue to carry the message of hope and salvation. May you walk in the footsteps of our Lord Jesus Christ, who came to proclaim freedom for the captives and release for the prisoners. Your ministry is a beacon of light in the world longing for peace that only Christ can provide. To the Norlandia Canadian Reformed Church family, may you be encouraged and strengthened by the promise of Isaiah 52, verse 7. As you gather in worship and fellowship, may you continue to proclaim the good news of salvation with boldness and conviction. 
May your efforts bear fruit in the lives of those who hear, leading them to experience the reign of God in their hearts and lives. On this joyous occasion, we rejoice with you and offer our prayers and our support as you continue to serve the Lord faithfully. May his grace sustain you, his love uphold you, and his peace fill your hearts now and always with heartfelt congratulations and warm regards on behalf of the Providence Canadian Reformed Church of Edmonton. Thank you. On behalf of the Devon Canadian Reformed Church, I will send congratulations to you and your new pastor. It is a great day indeed. And today, Fawcett Imaggio has become the seventh minister of the word to pastor this congregation. The Lord promised to gather his church from all peoples and nations, and we see evidence of that today. Most of us, I dare say, are from Gentile stock. But because we are not of this world, but belong to God's kingdom, Psalm 87 says, we are considered to be born in Zion. United by faith, we are your brothers and sisters. We as congregation of Devon are united to you by faith in our God and look forward to an ongoing and faithful relationship. It is our prayer for this congregation and Reverend Imaju that led by the Spirit, he may be led, guided by the word, may bring the word, prayed for, you may be able to pray. Touched by the passion and suffering of Christ, remain passionate. By God's grace, sing a new song with us on the, new, on the renewed earth. Thank you. On behalf of the Hope Canadian Reformed Church of Nirlandia, dear brothers and sisters of Nirlandia Canadian Reformed Church, and Reverend Faustin and Magdalena Imaju, the long-awaited Sunday has come. Given that Nirlandia in the past has been without a minister for over 15 years, these mere seven months would make one think you were hardly vacant. They always say good things come to those who wait, and Reverend, you've been waiting a while, so this is going to be good. If you and your wife find yourself getting lost in the manse, we know of one within walking distance that could suit your needs perfectly. We'd even help you move. In Irlandia, a minister can stay as short as three years and as long as ten and a half, but as we all know, it's the quality and not the quantity that counts. We are happy for you as congregation, and we'd even be more thankful if we had a minister of our own. We celebrate with you as neighboring congregation at the ordination of your new pastor and teacher. God in his goodness and wisdom has answered your prayers and again provided the servant to lead his people. We also congratulate you, Reverend Imaju, on your ordination as minister of the word here in Irlandia. What a testament of God's faithfulness that he has walked with you through all the years of your education and brought you and Magdalena to this point in your lives. We pray that the Lord will prepare and equip you for your work as he promises to do for each one of his children. May God bless you, Reverend Imaju, as you proclaim the rich gospel of salvation each Sunday. And may you as congregation receive it with joy and live it out together to his praise and glory. I'd like to finish with a text from Hebrews 13. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for, his, for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.
I also have two here that I would like to read from the Emmanuel Reformed Church of Barhead, the URC church here. Uh, dear Council and Congregation of Nerlandia Canadian Reformed Church, with thanksgiving to God, we congratulate you on the ordination and installation of Foster Namaju. We rejoice with you that God in his providence has graciously supplied your congregation with a pastor to shepherd your flock. We wish you the Lord's richest blessings as you worship and serve him together. We pray that he who has sanctified us in Christ Jesus called us to be saints, together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours, may fill you with his grace and peace, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 3 and 4. May he enable you by his word and spirit to continue to be built up in love, Ephesians 4, verse 16. And may he empower you to be that city set on a hill whose light cannot be hidden, Matthew 5, verse 14. May God grant we reverend Maju a fruitful ministry among you, and may your joy be full today and always. On behalf of the Council of Emmanuel Reformed Church, Kevin Teamstra, clerk. And I have one more from the Church of Tabor. Dear brothers and sisters in our Lord Jesus Christ, as we are not able to send a delegate for the ordination of a Reverend Faustin Imaju, we hope you will receive our well wishes by the way of this letter. It is with great joy in our hearts that we write to you for the occasion of having received the hand of the Lord, a pastor and a teacher for your congregation. We hope and pray that that through his preaching and teaching, you may continue to grow in the knowledge and faith and love and unity, and so be equipped to continue steadfastly serving our Lord as you persevere towards the goal of perfection. Reverend and Mrs. Amaju, we hope and pray that you quickly find yourselves very much at home in Nerlandia. May you together flourish there among God's people. Reverend Amaju, we place you in the Lord's hands, brother, asking that he may equip you with all that you need in order for you to be faithful witness throughout your ministry. May you be filled with his Holy Spirit to an unwaveringly proclaim the riches of faith and the glorious gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. God has provided another faithful minister to serve Classes Alberta. For this, we are very thankful, and we are eager to work along with you in this capacity and look forward to seeing you regularly with Christians' greetings, consistory with the deacons of the Table Canadian Reformed Church, Chairman Avert and Cameron. I also have an announcement. We know that some people with hard of hearing have a hard time following Reverend Imaju. He has printed out a few copies. We will make available through the ushers this afternoon. So if you want a copy, don't be scared to ask for it. Another thing is this afternoon after the service, there will be an opportunity to congratulate the couple with uh, his ordination. Thank you.